Welcome to episode 81, a new week of the Scarlet Faithful podcast, our fourth week now going into our daily format. Really appreciate everyone that has listened and watched so far. Appreciate all the positive feedback, and I hope this week is a great one. A lot to talk about this week and kind of set the table. Uh, we're into Tuesday, obviously yesterday, Memorial Day. I just wanted to hope everyone had a great Memorial Day weekend. Those uh, from the military, uh, thank you for your service and uh, hope everyone was able to take the holiday and reflect. I know I did, and I always uh, talk to my father-in-law who served uh, as well. So um, just in terms of going into this week, a lot to wonder about and think about for Rutgers basketball, and I hope people keep things in perspective and the clock is ticking. Uh, the waiting game is officially answering its 11th hour. We are a little bit over, a little bit under 36 hours until we will officially know whether Cliff Omori and Paul Mulcahy return to Rutgers basketball. The deadline is midnight at the end of Wednesday, May 31st. Today is Tuesday, May 30th. So I've touched on both. Uh, Cliff and Paul in terms of their situations and what I've thought. So I have noticed people have been, you know, sending me comments and questions and in other formats and on social media and stuff. And sadly, not everyone listens to this podcast all the time, but (laughs) Uh, so just to kind of rehash, but also um, from what I'm hearing, you know, it's going to go down to the wire in terms of Cliff specifically Uh, He still has uh, workouts, I I believe, well, two as of going into this week. He had two more workouts to go. So you can imagine kind of the last minute uh, feedback that he's getting. Uh, Has he already kind of made up his mind one way or the other? What are those teams going to tell him? Uh, It's, you know, it's a guessing game, right? I mean, I've talked about why I think it's very possible Cliff will not return. Uh, I don't think it's just about the NBA draft. I think people get hung up on that and think, you know, he's not going to get drafted most likely. So why wouldn't he return to Rutgers? Uh, And I've talked, you know, at length for a few weeks now about the G League and why I think that that's a very viable option uh, for players. Uh, First of all, the competition is really good. It's all players trying to make the NBA. It's, you know, above, a step above uh, college, uh, if not two steps, the coaching you get there, you know, it's, it's, you're, you're starting a career, right? So that's all you have to focus on in the G league. You can make really good money, uh, mid-level six figures. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a real option and a team is investing. If you sign a two way deal, right. For the G league with an NBA team, they are investing one full year with you. Uh, it's very rare that they would cut you, uh, or not invest the entire year in a player that they want to develop. And I really think Cliff ch- checks a lot of boxes in terms of the type of player that an NBA team would invest in for a year right now. You know, he's 21. Uh, he's a bit raw. He's underdeveloped offensively, but he started late in his career in terms of, you know, taking basketball seriously. Uh, I, I don't think that, honestly, Rutgers gets enough credit for developing Cliff. I think people forget, yes, he was a top 50 recruit, but a lot of big men coming into college are not developed offensively. And Cliff really, you know, I mean, he could dunk. That was it. And uh, he's gotten better. He's gotten better in a lot of areas. Is he fully developed on the block as a post, you know, low post scorer? No. Does he need to develop more? Yes. Uh, Does his shot need to get better? Yes. Are those things that can get better in the G League? Absolutely. Um, could get better at Rutgers as well, but I think that people forget how far, you know, I mean, obviously Miles Johnson was the starter when Cliff got to Rutgers, but his freshman year, he was very limited on an offensive end and defensively. I mean, even his sophomore year, you know, he made major strides in the defensive end from a sophomore campaign to his junior campaign when he became an all first team, big 10 defender. He has developed at Rutgers and, Perhaps going to the G League now is what's best for his personal, professional playing development moving forward. Obviously, as Rutgers fans, we want him back. It would be a big blow if he doesn't return. 
again, I think it all comes down to that two way two way deal in the G League. If he has guarantees following the end of day tomorrow that a team will invest in him and sign him following the draft, similar to Ron Harper Jr. and how that really worked out well for him. And that's a positive example for Cliff to look at. A player that gave up a year of his eligibility, did not get drafted, signed with Toronto, had a very good year in the G League, really developed and almost transformed, well, it did kind of transform his game. For those that didn't follow, uh, he is a much different player now. Uh, and, and obviously, you know, listen, he played a certain role at Rutgers. And, but um, him taking his professional job so seriously and just investing all of his time and efforts into basketball, you know, Ron Harper Jr. got a lot better last year. And he made really good money. And now he's got a chance to make the Raptors full-time next season. So there's a clear path that Cliff can reference uh, in terms of making a decision. That doesn't mean it will work out the same for him. But it's obviously a viable option. So he signed with an agent. You know that agent's going to be motivated for Cliff to stay in the draft and hopefully sign a two-way deal. We'll see. We'll see what happens. I think that, you know, odds, I mean, I, I, 50-50, I, I, I think, you know, it could, it could go either way. That's a cop-out. But, you know. My gut, well, I just I would not be surprised at all if he stays in the draft, gets a two-way deal in the G League. He, you know, he he's super athletic. His physical attributes are, you know, at the top of the charts of everyone that was at the G League and even the combine, his wingspan. And um, you know, he has those kind of physical qualities, he has the explosiveness, he has the athleticism, he has the willingness to work. There's a lot of positive feedback about just his motor, how he's constantly working on both ends of the floor, uh, how he's very coachable. Uh, you know Peichel has said that about him to anyone that's asked. So he has a lot of pluses that I think would not surprise me at all if a team took a chance on him and invested a full year in him. We'll see. I really, really hope he returns. I do think it's possible. If, you know, I had to bet right now, I I, I kind of feel like Cliff is, is going to stay in the draft, not come back to Rutgers. But I don't know that. I haven't spoken to anyone affiliated with him. I'm just making an educated guess based on the situation and what I think will happen in terms of what the G League offers. I think that the G League doesn't get enough respect just in terms of the competition, in terms of the salary. Someone said, oh, the starting salary in the G League is 40000 You know, that's that's different from a, a two-way deal. You know, listen, if he stays in the draft, he doesn't get a two-way deal. Yeah, that's that's a tough break. Um, but there's enough of those around that if, if multiple teams are promising him, I think there's a very good chance that one team will sign him. All it takes is one. Paul Mulcahy, all indications have been that he'll return. He hasn't officially announced he's returning. If you remember back to Cliff, excuse me, Caleb, Ron, Gio, over the years, they've explored, you know, they, they went through the process and they announced they were returning. Literally, I mean, Ron and Gio that year, two years ago, it was, I believe, after 5 p.m., both of them finally announced they were coming back. I do think there's more, uh, specifically with Cliff, there's much more of an unknown now in terms of if he actually will or not. I think the decision's still being made, to be honest, because he's still working out. Paul, you would think, you know, he, he was reported to have a workout last week. You would think he's leaning towards coming back or that he's expected to come back or he's already decided to come back. But if anyone wants to predict what's inside Paul Mulcahy's head, I mean, more power to you, but and I, I mean that completely respectfully, but that kid's been through a ton at Rutgers. He went through a ton last year. He's, um, you know, wears the heart, his heart on his sleeve. He's done so much for Rutgers. Um, that was a tough last six weeks for him last season. It was a tough last season for him with all the shoulder, you know, multiple shoulder or, or if there's multiple shoulder injuries or not, it was – the beginning of the season, the end of the season, the middle of the season, I mean, he was dealing with stuff just all the time. This is a kid that, you know, broke his nose and, and had his uh, one of his fingers horizontal, you know, in the same game 
I believe it was was it Iowa a couple of years ago. I mean, this kid's tough as nails. He's from Bayonne. He's got a big family. He's been a hundred percent Rutgers since the day he stepped on campus. You know, he had other opportunities in recruitment. You know, Northwestern was all over him. He never wavered. He made a, a decision to go to Rutgers pretty quickly. Didn't even take, you know, the amount of visits he could have taken. He's shown extreme loyalty. And I just, you know, the fans that are, have been out there and pretty vocal, hoping he moves on, I, I will never understand. He's very valuable to the program. Can he be frustrated in terms of how he uh, performs and or reacts on the court? Yes, he can be. But he's done far more good than bad for this program. And with Cam Spencer gone, the opportunity that maybe people were thinking wasn't there for him is back there for him. We'll talk about the transfer portal in a minute, but I think Rutgers has every intention to keep the ball in his hands, even with Noah Fernandes and Derek Simpson expected to take a leap. You know, those three guys are going to be, I don't want to say interchangeable. They have different skill sets. You know, Paul is different, but they're all going to be extremely valuable. And to lose – if Mulcahy doesn't return, it would be a huge loss. Anybody that says otherwise, respectfully, I don't think knows what they're talking about. Um, so we'll see. It's a dicey 33 hours at this point in terms of what's going to happen. Uh, it's tense. Um, the roster, you know, Steve Peichel has been on hold for, at least from a big man perspective, Cam Spencer, I mean, he left 10 days. Is it 10 days ago at this point? Uh, 11 days. So people saying, oh, you know, they're not pursuing anyone in the portal for the. We, first of all, that's not true. Secondly, you're not going to hear about <laughs> who they're contacting. I mean, Rutgers does a really good job and prioritizes keeping things to a minimum in terms of who they're recruiting out of the portal. Uh, there's sensitivity to that just in terms of. Um, you know, wanting to keep things under wraps. They, they like to keep things quiet. And if you remember back, Jacob Young, it felt like he just kind of showed up and boom, he was committed on his visit. You know, Cam Spencer, that news of him visiting last year was kind of out of nowhere. I know there's another example uh, that I'm forgetting. Uh, even when um, Lofton, uh, the point guard from St. Bonaventure visited last year, he ultimately went to Florida. But when he when it was reported that he was visiting, that was out of nowhere. So they do a really good job of that. And I think this is where, you know, I want to lace in <laughs> a little bit Ted Lasso. Uh, the last episode is premiering on Wednesday. I believe midnight tonight, actually, you know, one of my all time favorite shows and uh, the belief of hope, right? Let's just, let's believe in hope here. Things are not falling. Last week I talked about the sky is not falling. Apparently that was a popular headline, subheadline following that podcast. But I digress that believe in hope, right? Rutgers, Steve Peichel has figured things out for so long. They're gonna get, they're gonna get, they're gonna get a guard that can play. Is it gonna be someone that can step in and be a Cam Spencer? No, but I've talked about this before, just the ability to reinvent things and kind of tweak things and change styles. And I'm really excited to see what they can do there. That Rutgers could really be an up-tempo team next year if they add a piece from the portal. If Paul doesn't come back, then you're talking about two pieces you have to add in the backcourt. If Cliff doesn't return, then you're talking about two pieces you have to add in the frontcourt. I know that's scary. I know that it's very late in the game, but – to just wave the white flag on next season, to, to just be negative and skeptical that things are, you know, falling apart, that there's a greater issue here. It's, it's just, you know, it, it's, it's unnecessary panic. And listen, I'm nervous. I'm nervous about the next, you know, day plus until Cliff and Paul return. If Cliff doesn't come back, that's, that's a huge hit, right? It, it hurts the roster significantly, arguably more than camp. I think he's, Harder to replace than Cam is. Definitely. Um, you know, Paul would be harder to replace for a lot of reasons. 
this is what you know the new off season is now and 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 for those that have been critical of why are they waiting so long well they have until midnight on wednesday night so why not use it if we, we don't know what's going on in their decision making process we don't know more news on sunday night or monday night excuse me jeff goodman tweeting that cam spencer is down to four visits ucla yukon miami Oklahoma. Oklahoma is bizarre. They've been bad. I don't know what their NIL situation is like. They certainly, you know, he, he could probably go there and shoot 15 shots a game. That's probably a motivating factor as well. Now that he's in the portal, a lot of reports that Georgetown was that team that was essentially tampering and lured him out. Ed Cooley, you know, secured a big amount of NIL. When he took that job, I, I've seen quotes of $4 million a year to work with in kind of a pool, player pool. And they didn't even get a visit, aren't even getting a visit from Cam Spencer. And it just shows the reality of the portal now. I do think that, you know, there, there was one team in mind that Cam had in terms of being NIL motivated to, to leave Rutgers. And now, I mean, look at the programs involved, the defending national champions, a Final Four team. And UCLA, UCLA, there's a connection there with an assistant, uh, Evo uh, Semovec, who was at Loyola of Maryland when Spencer was there. UConn obviously has a great opportunity for him to step in with a key role. And then you have Miami, you know, kind of like the poster boy for uh, NIL right now uh, with John Ruiz, the CEO of Life Wallet. You know, Nigel Pack, you know, transferred there last year. I believe he got a two year, $800,000 deal that, which was reported. Isaiah Wong was upset. I mean, they, you know, they, they signed the Cavender twins on the women's basketball team. Uh, Miami, I, I believe he, he pays everyone on the football team. I mean, Miami is really the ultimate NIL situation right now. So for Cam to consider them, you know, Jim Lorang is a tremendous head coach, but that I think shows you that yes, NIL is the major factor in his uh, reason for entering the portal, he might not necessarily decide to go to Miami, but what I wrote about last night, which I think is key, is that he's not considering a Big Ten team. There were rumors about Maryland. There were rumors about Indiana. I mean, Indiana would have been really hard for Rutgers fans to take. Maryland would have stunk, too. That would have been – it just would have stunk, you know. And uh, I know people would have been excited about booing him, but listen, you know, it's a free country – he has a right to pursue whatever opportunities he wants. I'm just glad it's not in the Big Ten, that we don't have to worry about defending him next year, and that that whole drama is just – it's a moot point. Now, hopefully wherever he goes, Rutgers plays him in the NCAA tournament. Now, that would be fun, especially if it's UConn. But wish him well. You should wish him well. It's going to be interesting to see where he ends up. But I thought the timing of everything, now we know where he's visiting – we're waiting on Cliff and Paul. I put out a video today uh, on YouTube, if uh, you don't follow me there, um, on Dylan Harper. Positive news with him, we talked about last week, trending in a very positive direction with Rutgers. Uh, he played at the EYBL this past weekend, four games, uh, and I had uh, exclusive video footage of his fourth game. Uh, thank you to Hitman Hoops. Uh, who was there and took the footage for me. We're both part of the Full Ride Network, uh, which is um, a new network that we're both a part of and, and you know, own our own sites along with Ant, right? Uh, if you if you don't know who he is, a huge presence on uh, Twitter and uh, former Michigan basketball player. So he was at UFL. He, he sent me a message and said, hey, do you want me to take some video? So I said, yes. And I know it's not traditional highlight reel footage, but what I loved about it, was that there was countless, maybe not countless because it was a two and a half minute video, but it was it was featuring Dylan Harper attacking the rim and drawing contact. And he didn't, you know, I got a couple of and ones, but a lot of it, he was just drawing contact. He was relentless in attacking. He wasn't settling for jumpers. And I just thought his mentality was on full display. And as much as people want to hype, you know, and he's tremendous talent, he might be the number one rated player in the 2024 class before it's all said and done. He's number two right now, but I just thought his mentality, he's third in the EYBL and assists through 16 games, his unselfishness, 
but also his willingness to sacrifice physically and to get to the rim. He, he's just, yes, of course. I mean, he's, he's, a, he's a huge talent, but his mentality, you know, he's going to drive players to greatness. He's going to be such a great cultural fit if he goes to Rutgers under Steve Peichel. And that's what made me excited. And that's what I wanted to highlight in that video. So check it out. And we'll, we'll, it's a wait and see. I'm going to have multiple videos probably. If, if Paul and Cliff announce together, if they announce separately, you know, I'll do a reaction to both. Uh, keep your nose to the grindstone, but stay positive. Believe in hope. And even if neither return, I still, I will say in the camera tomorrow that the sky is not falling, that, you know, it's a very difficult situation for the staff to have. I mean, we'd have five open scholarships. It would be fascinating to see what they do, but to just write things off, especially when you have, you still have key pieces on this roster. Noah Fernandes, Derek Simpson, you have Gavin Griffiths coming in. You have Moat Mag recovering from injury. You have Andre Hyatt back. Let's not forget about Wolf. So, you know, would they need a lot of help? Yes, for sure. No doubt. I wouldn't be sugarcoating it. But let's just enjoy the ride. Enjoy that the fact that here we are entering June and Rutgers men's basketball is at the top of our mind and we're talking about it every day. That makes me excited. And – Let's hope they both come back, and we have a lot to talk about in a positive way. But if they don't come back, then we're full-on transfer portal, you know, and I will be literally digging and researching for days on potential candidates and options. But, again, don't take this lull in the transfer portal as the staff and Pykel not being prepared. If they've proven anything over time, they are super prepared. They have contingency plans for contingency plans. And once Cliff and Paul announce their decisions, they will then exercise those plans. So, as Tom Petty always says, the waiting is the hardest part. Do what you have to do to get through the next day and a half. Tweet at me if you want, and I'll be back as soon as Paul and or Cliff make decisions and we'll react to all of it. Thank you for listening and watching once again at the Scarlet Faith.